Hello and welcome to What's New in Education. This series of programs looks at new educational products and services that cover a wide cross-section of curriculum areas and age levels that are available throughout Australia. In today's program we'll be celebrating the 80th birthday of the Gould League and we'll also take a look at an ozone project kit that's been developed by the Australian Conservation Foundation. Students at Ivanhoe East Primary School will be talking about the Young Australians Best Book Awards and we'll have a look at what's on during Children's Week in October. We'll also take a look at a fascinating new computer database and activities kit that's based on the transportation of juvenile offenders to Tasmania in the early 19th century. Students will also demonstrate a new activities kit from Aussie Sports, and finally, we'll have a look at some new project materials from the National Trust. You can bat, you can kick, you can run, you can swing, you can team, you can scream, you can bowl, you can have a ball. Because I sports are good, sports are good. Sports everyone can play. Aussie sports are good. Sports are good. Sports for you to play. You don't have to be a champion. You just have to learn the rules. It's really great just to have a go. Hit it. Look at it go. Yeah. Aussie sports are good. Sports are good. Sports everyone can play. Aussie sports are good. Ever heard of minky or t-ball? They're just two of the modified sports that have been introduced to primary schools all over Australia by Aussie Sports. And Aussie Sports have taken this a step further and developed a series of activities cards for grades five and six students entitled Sport in Australian Society. Ross Monaghan is the Victorian coordinator of Aussie Sports. Ross, could you tell us about the new cards? Well, the cards were designed by the Australian Sports Commission as part of the Aussie Sports Program to develop the sport education philosophy that we're on about. And uh, there's a set of 37 cards, and they look into the history of Australian sport. So we're really trying to push the education side of sport. Can you tell us a little more about what's actually on the cards? We've got about uh, 12 cards on the history of Aboriginal sport and Torres Strait Islander sport. And then we go into colonial days and then into the 20th century. And each card just depicts a different aspect of the history in that particular era and uh, describes, describes it for the children. They read a little bit about it and then do some activities related to it to reinforce what we're talking about. Beth Rifka College in Melbourne has been involved with Aussie sports right from the beginning and physical education teacher Mary Ann McKeon has been quick to take up the new cards with her students. Well we've been using the cards in the classroom. We've been integrating phys ed with English, with maths and with social studies. How have you been doing that? Well the, all the cards have activities on them and we've been able to do some measurement activities and create, uh, calculate area in maths, uh, do some creative writing in English. In this maths card, they had to, first of all, come out and measure the courts we've got here. So they came out with trundle wheels, with tape measures and rulers, measured the courts, and then they went back to the classroom and calculated the area of each court, and then they were able to compare with the reference books the area to see whether our courts were uh, true sizes or not. The girls had to do a creative writing exercise, pretending they were a piece of sporting equipment or, or they, were, they had to follow a life of a runner. And they actually worked in groups, which is great for cooperation and teamwork. Uh, one, one group chose to be John McEnroe's tennis racket, so you can imagine what type of life it had. And also the girls were involved making up a quiz. They, they did a sale of the century game and they had to research the questions themselves and then they played the game out. We've got some buzzer sets. And, that was terrific, they had a great time. I think the Aussie sport cards are good because they have all these topics on them and you have to write stories about them and also there's all the activities and you can do English while you're doing sport and also just physical Aussie sports is really great. I also like researching for South Century, um, looking to the library for the references and I like Aussie sports. Well the sports in Australian society cards certainly look terrific and if you'd like some more information about them or you'd like to order a set, you can write to the Australian Sports Commission, Post Office Box 176, 
Belconnen in the ACT 2616 or telephone 062 521 531. Yabba. No, it's not another Swedish pop group, or a type of crayfish, or even a chat across the back fence. Yabba stands for Young Australians Best Book Awards. The Yabba Council believes that children should be able to express their views publicly about the sort of books they enjoy reading, and this in turn should encourage them to read and discuss more books. Children can both nominate books for the Yabba Awards and vote for them. Now, nominations have closed for 1989, but it's still not too late to vote for the Yabba Awards. Voting closes on the 25th of September. Children at Ivanhoe East Primary School have been taking part in both nominating and voting for their favourite books for the Yabba Awards. I've read about 17 books and the, um, the one I nominated, Boss of the Pool, got on the voting list. You get to read a lot of books to vote for Yabba and I read a few few but one of my favourites was so much to tell you and I voted for that but there's also a few that um, like playing beat by Seven Little Australians or also by Ruth Park. Instead of all the um, teachers and all that voting about the Australian books the children get to do it so you know you just put down whatever Australian book you like. I've read um, about 20 or 17 books and I nominated So Much To Tell You by John Marsden and I think I'm going to vote for that because that's on the list. Well, Eleventh Hour is about an uh, elephant that's turning 11 and he decided to have his uh, uh, feast at 11 o'clock and then when all his guests came they show, he showed him showed the feast to them and then uh, uh, when they were about to have it they came back and it was all gone. Uh, I read Ginger Mix. It's a book about a boy in about the 1950s and his parents give him a hard time and there's this big bully called Tiger Kelly and he's always um, chasing him and things. And there's his arch rival, Eddie Coogan. And um, then this big um, contest or fight starts up. And um, one of the kids had brought a slingshot for a uh, um, birthday present to Polly and um, grabs the slingshot, puts the, a cupcake on it and then fires it and um, oh, it hit someone in the face. And then these two adults come into the room. One's a um, vicar and goes, you'll be punished for this and starts praying. And then Ginger throws this massive cake into his face and <laughs> um, with it right in his face. What I think is good about Yabba is just that it's the actual children that get to vote and choose their, their best book and also lets people find new books to read and if they haven't read the book that's been given the award they might want to read it because there weren't a lot of other people thought it was good. The book I read was Playing Betty Bo and it was about a young girl who, oh well, she's about 16, who went back into time and she um, she stayed with the family and she, she fell in love with a man and there was a fire and um, she rescued a little boy from it, and um, then when she went, went, when she went back, the the man she fell in love with um, got married, and then when she went back to um, where she was living in her real time, um, she there was a man who she knew who looked exactly like him, and I just liked it because it was interesting and exciting. The important thing about the Yabba Awards are that they're Children's Choice Awards. Only children nominate books and only children vote for them. So if you'd like some more information about Yabba and you'd like to vote, then you can write to the Yabba Council, Post Office Box 238Q in Victoria 3101. Please enclose a stamp self-addressed envelope and schools and libraries should also have copies of the voting forms. 
Don't forget, voting closes on the 25th of September. So what does Yabba mean again? Young Australians Best Book Award! When we think of white Australia's beginnings, we certainly think of convicts and something of the conditions in which they lived. But what we don't always remember is that many of these so-called criminals that were sent over from England were only teenagers. In fact, they were about the average age of a year nine or ten student. These lads who were transported in the early 1800s found themselves in a tiny place called Point Pure in Tasmania. Their personal and criminal records have been kept to this very day and they've been transferred onto a computer database which has been put together with a kit activities and teacher's notes for use in classrooms. Malcolm Mathias is the editor of the very exciting Point Pure Lads Tried and Transported Kit. Malcolm, what an extraordinary idea to turn archival footage into a classroom database. Where did the idea come from? I wish I could claim the idea, but the idea grew out of a summer research program at Port Arthur. It originally came from uh, Robin McLaughlin, who is a lecturer at Mitchell CAE, and Peter McPhee, who is the historian down at Port Arthur, and they decided that the information was available and a database would be a good idea, so they in fact developed the initial Point Pure database from this one, from which this one has grown. Right. Well, what's actually in the kit? The kit contains a variety of resource materials based around the computer disk itself, which contains the database, but also included in the kit is some historical background material uh, with an essay written by Peter McPhee about the Point Pure boys, their life, their diet, the sorts of discipline they are subjected to, the regulations, etc. It also contains a database user's guide which explains to teachers and to students exactly how to use the database. It also contains a teacher's manual which has ideas on how to use the database in a variety of subject areas. It is not just a computer education disc, nor is it just an Australian history disc, so the teacher's manual covers a variety of areas. When we read the original Point Pure database, we felt that there needed to be some visual record of what Point Pure was on about so that students at the year 9 or 10 level could visualise Point Pure. So we have included a set of slides which show Point Pure today and some of the artefacts and things that belong to that era. Malcolm, can you tell us how students can use the database and what sort of information they'll get out of it? Certainly. The original Point Pure database was a, a small database management system that was designed specifically for the Point Pure information. What we have done is adapt the original information into the more acceptable AppleWorks format to run on the Apple II series so that people are more familiar with the means by which you can get the data. The data contains the personal details in terms of names, uh, where they are from in terms of Scotland, England, etc. It contains their criminal details in terms of the, where they were tried, the sentence they were sentenced to when they were transported to Australia. It also contains details of the crime itself, whether it was stealing or housebreaking, or in one case stabbing a horse with a pitchfork. One of the very popular activities that has been uh, used extensively in the trial schools is to imagine that you're an employer in Tasmania at the time these Point Pure boys were going through and to imagine yourself trying to hire a work crew to construct a new building so that you would use the trades that these boys were trained in, be it uh, carpentry or shipwrights or the nature of the particular job the employer might want. You can then search the database for boys that were trained in that particular trade area. You can then assess which ones you would prefer to employ on the basis of the nature of their original crime, how many offences they might have committed since they were jailed at Point Pure, and on that basis select, shall we say, a reliable work crew to get your building done in Hobart Town back in the 1830s and 1840s. Malcolm, the Point Pure boys were very young. Did they get any schooling? Yes, they were very young, and one of the aspects of Point Pure was, in fact, to provide them with some schooling opportunities. It was felt by the authorities at that time that to have useful working citizens in the society as they were released, it would be in their best interests to make sure they were given a trade training. So that they did in fact have formal schooling in terms of reading and writing, but they were also given this trade training 
which made, which turned out a, a large number of tradesmen for Hobart in particular, and they included things like carpenters and shipwrights. They also did a lot of brick making and stone masonry, which was in fact the materials for which were in, used in Port Arthur and Point Pure to construct the buildings. The bricks I find particularly interesting because they contain a thumbprint of the boys themselves that made them as they pressed them out of the wooden moulds. And if you compare the thumbprint in a port Point Pure brick, if you compare the thumbprint in a Point Pure brick with the thumbprint in a Port Arthur brick, there is quite a difference in size between the, the boy's size at Point Pure and the large man's size at Port Arthur. Thanks Malcolm. The kit looks absolutely fabulous and I'm sure that teachers and students will get a lot of use out of it. If you're interested in obtaining a copy of the kit or getting some more information about it, then you can write or call in to the Education Shop, Level 1 of the Rialto, Ministry of Education Tower, 525 Collins Street, Melbourne 3000, or telephone 03 62 82124. Or you can also get more information from Brian Sharpley at the Computer Education Unit, Genoa Street, Moorabbin, 3189, or telephone him on 03 555 8399. Children's Week is an annual national event that highlights the needs, rights, aspirations and accomplishments of children. It's also a time to celebrate childhood and also to reflect on the way we nurture and educate our children. Everybody should have food and love and drinks. That's what I think. They have a right to go to school and play. They have two rights. They need love and they need care. And the third right is the most important one. You need money and lots and lots and lots and lots of other things. The theme for Children's Week this year is the rights of the child, our national responsibility. The excerpt you've just seen is from a film produced by UNICEF entitled What Rights Has a Child? The official dates for Children's Week this year are Sunday the 22nd of October to Sunday the 29th of October. Janice Bates on the organising committee of Children's Week. Janice, how did Children's Week get started? Well, every week is Children's Week, really. But 31 years ago, the Children's Welfare Association of Victoria began Child Care Week. And very many organisations joined in who were involved with children. And in 1976, it became Children's Week and a special week for all children. Where did this year's theme, The Rights of the Child, Our National Responsibility, come from? Well, it's 30 years since the Declaration of the Rights of the Child by the United Nations. And so it's very appropriate. It's also 10 years since the Year of the Child. So it's good that children are thinking about their rights and responsibilities and also perhaps thinking of children in other countries who are not nearly as well off as children in Australia, those whose right to um, shelter, to love, to food and to medicines are not being met. And um, it's a time for the community to be thinking of their responsibilities to children. If you'd like some more information about Children's Week, then you can write to Daryl O'Halloran, Projects Branch, Department of Premier and Cabinet, Ground Floor 1, Treasury Place, Melbourne, 3002, or phone 03 651 5013. They'll be able to give you more details about what's happening in Children's Week all over Australia and give you the right person to contact in your state. The greenhouse effect and the destruction of the ozone layer both present a very real threat to life on our planet. And if we want to continue to enjoy our natural environment, we've got to take some sort of action now. The Australian Conservation Foundation has put out a new kit called an Ozone Project Kit, and it gives helpful information, ideas and strategies to both teachers and students. Dallas Kinnear is from the Australian Conservation Foundation. Dallas, why has the Foundation put out a kit specifically designed for students? 
Well, the first uh, student need we're trying to answer with the kit is to save the ozone layer and protect their future. Um, the international and Australian measures taken to save it so far are inadequate, so further action is needed. Secondly, young people are very worried about what we're doing to this planet. They want to change things for the better and they don't know how and they're very pessimistic and despairing. Now the cure for that is to envisage a better future situation and then to take positive and practical action to bring that future situation about and that's what the project does. But again we're overlooking the enormous contribution that students can make to our world. We shut them away in schools for 12 years and say work hard and then we might have a useful job for you. The Ozone Project says there's a very important job for you right now. Raise public awareness and support to save the ozone layer. And thirdly, um, we olds can't save it the ozone layer alone. Uh, we're all part of the problem, we've all got to be part of the solution, including young people. Can you describe what's in the kit? Well, the kit comes um, in an ongoing fashion. The first project was sent out in April to principals of all secondary schools and consisted of a book, the ozone message, and six posters. Uh, the second Part of the project was a newsletter sent out in May and that had further activities, especially for primary schools because that went to the librarian of primary and secondary schools. Our third parcel sent out in July was a Radio Australia tape for senior students and that uh, is on ozone depression and the greenhouse effect, of course. And then we've got two more newsletters to come but schools will only receive those if they submit the name of a contact person to ACF. Thank you, Dallas. The kit looks really fabulous. Now the kit has been sent free of charge to all secondary schools, but if you haven't received a copy and you'd like one, then you can write to the Australian Conservation Foundation, 672B Glenferry Road in Hawthorne, Victoria, 3122, or telephone them on 03 819 This year the Gould League celebrates 80 years of commitment to environmental education and during that time they've certainly given a lot of information and fun to a great number of children. I'm sure you've still got your Gould League badges and certificates at home somewhere. John Moliner is the manager of the Gould League in Victoria. John, happy 80th birthday, that's a really long time. How did the Gould League first get started? Yes Lily, back in 1909, 80 years ago, a one of the country school teachers, Sir Jesse MacMichael, uh, was very concerned about what the children were learning about their environment. So she negotiated with the Ministry of Education, then the Education Department, with the formation of a group, which ended up being the Gould League. Well, what are some of the new publications that the Gould League has available? Yes, well, we have two new exciting posters. Um, the first one's the Paris poster, Paris of Australia. In this particular poster, we've depicted about 40 species of Australian parrots. They've been very carefully illustrated, and they've been illustrated in a habitat format, so that the bird's actually sitting on the type of branch that it would actually be living on. Um, in some cases, like the fig parrot, the fig is actually illustrated on that. On the back of the poster, we've included a whole range of activity materials of what teachers and community leaders can do with groups of children in terms of finding out more about parrots. It's a very exciting poster, a very exciting painting. Our very latest one is a Wales poster. There's been a big demand for this poster and finally here it is. Our in-house artist Alexis Beckett very carefully painted this one. Um, the poster itself shows the size variation between the different whales and they certainly do vary in size as you can see from the poster. We've also included a little diver just to give an idea of what the size of man is in compa compared with these whales. And once again on the reverse side of the poster we've got a whole range of activity materials and identification ideas. songbook was especially prepared for the Gould League. Um, Gavin Burt, who was a member of the Gould League staff, is now a teacher in, in primary school. Um, working with his class prepared the songs. He wrote the script. Um, we've got a tape that accompany, accompanies it. His class is actually singing on that tape. It's a way of looking at the environment and environmental education through a different medium, like 
music and drama. Each song in the booklet also contains a page of activities that relate to that particular theme that the song is on about. Um, it's been very successful. Uh, we also have the Gouldley Guide to Protecting the Environment. The Gouldley Guide to Protecting the Environment relates to helping community groups and teachers implement the state conservation strategy. We're particularly concerned about that. We've got a wonderful strategy in Victoria to help to protect the environment. It's very important that we know about that strategy and know what we can do. And the Gourley Guide to Protecting the Environment gives a whole range of ideas and activities and resource materials which are available to help implement that strategy. Thanks, John. Those materials look fabulous. And it's nice to know that the Gould League will continue to protect our environment and educate children and adults about it. If you'd like copies of anything that you've seen on the program today or if you'd like to just come in and visit the Gould League bookshop, you're very welcome to do that. You can write to the Gould League at Post Office Box 446 or you can come in and visit at 67 High Street in Paran. 3181 is the postcode and you can telephone for information on 03 511 493. Well, that's all we've got time for on That's New in Education. I hope you've seen something on today's program that's inspired you. And we'll see you next time on TV Ed Australia. Leave that tree alone, it is my home. Don't chop it down. Don't break its branches. It's a rather special.